This is a Frontline Club event recorded on 30th of April 2020, covering COVID-19, with Elizabeth Palmer, John Sweeney, David Heyman, and Craig Oliver. I'm Elizabeth Palmer, and I'm a journalist for CBS News, um, and I beg you for your forbearance and patience this afternoon. Uh, this Zoom conferencing is new to all of us. Um, and certainly I'm no expert, so uh, we think we have safety nets, but if there's a glitch, bear with us and we'll solve it. Uh, behind me, uh, just over my, my shoulder, you can probably see the angel of stable internet. I'm hoping that uh, she remains on duty for the whole <laughs> session. <laughs> now, um, if you'd like to submit questions, uh, there is a button. Uh, on your screen to either raise your hand or a form to fill in if you'd prefer to do it in print and we encourage you to do that too after our speakers have had a chance to uh, discuss things among themselves we will come to you for questions the whole session should go until about a quarter past four let me now move on to introducing my guests first of all professor david Heyman, cbe he's a professor in infectious diseases and epidemiology here in London at the School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. He's also been the Chairman of Public Health England and Assistant Director General for Health Security at the World Health Organization, where he uh, took a real leadership role in uh, confronting and eventually bringing SARS under control. Welcome, David. Thank you, Elizabeth. Sir Craig Oliver is a Principal at Taneo, which is a consulting firm for businesses and senior managers and executives here in London. He was Director of Politics and Communications for the former British Prime Minister, David Cameron. And of course, in that role, he was responsible for the government's strategy and messaging, which means he's got a very particular and sharp lens for looking at the, the current information ecosystem. Craig, thank you for joining us. Good afternoon. And finally, John Sweeney, who is very well known here in Britain and around the world as an investigative journalist. He not only worked for The Observer magazine, but also he had a very high profile role at the BBC, both on Panorama and Newsnight. John, hello. Hi. I've left the BBC, um, but um, I'm still fighting. Um, hello. <laughs> very reassuring. <laughs> So I'm uh, going to ask each of our speakers to start with about a minute's worth of remarks, setting out their stall, as it were. And David, I'm handing over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. You know, in the last, um, in the last six or seven, well, in the last three months, actually, we've learned quite a bit about this new coronavirus. We've learned its epidemiology, how it transmits from person to person. We've learned a lot about its transmissibility and also about the types of illness that it causes in humans. And this has happened because there's been free sharing of information among all countries in the world, despite the fact of, that there are geopolitical tensions that are riding over those technical leaders. So technical leaders through the World Health Organization and others have been quite active in sharing information and understanding the disease. At the second time, countries have begun to deal with this outbreak in a variety of ways, some more intense than others, but all have based this on their national risk assessment. And maybe we can talk about that more later as we move on. Thank you very much. Craig, over to you. Thanks, Elizabeth. Well, uh, in my career, I've been on both sides of the divide in terms of politics and journalism. And I think watching coronavirus has been fascinating to see how both trades have dealt with this. When you speak privately to people in the cabinet, they'll accept that mistakes have been made, not least in terms of testing and ensuring that money is available. But I think journalists have sometimes struggled with what they see as the public mood in terms of giving politicians the benefit of the doubt, particularly when it's clear Boris Johnson had a near-death experience. I think journalists tend to operate from a position of probing weakness, and their factory setting is often one of negativity. And that definitely has its place in this, but I also think it's more often than not felt out of place, especially when the mood, I think, is much more giving the benefit of the doubt to politicians as we're still in the middle of the crisis. That can be volatile, though. I think the public is well versed in terms of the threat to the NHS, but less clear in terms of the upcoming economic carnage. And it might be worth bringing that out in the wider discussion and the volatility that could be the case in that. 
Thank you very much. John, let's hear from you. Journalism's job is to tell truth to power, but how do we cope when there is no settled truth? The answer, it seems to me, is badly. Before sticking the boot in too hard to the British parliamentary lobby, I think there's a, a quick international tour de raison makes sense. North Korea, no point. We don't even know whether Kim Jong no show is alive or dead. Chinese state-approved journalists have been dreadful. Its citizen reporters have reclaimed some honour at risk of vanishing. In Russia, the Kremlin's tame lapdogs have yelped to the boss's tune disastrously. In the States, Fox TV has excelled itself as a toxic polluter of scientific fact. So, British journalism, and most of the time we've been talking about the lobby here, has done much better than those sorry COVID deniers, but not, in my judgment, good enough. The you scratch my back, I'll scratch your back culture of the lobby has meant that not enough light was shone at the critical time in January and February and early March on the British government. In my view, with the exception of outliers like people like Piers Morgan and Panorama, most broadcasters and most papers have called it wrong and have given Boris Johnson's government too much rope. The cost is what looks to be the worst heap of dead in the world after the United States. And that is not good. Thank you very much to all of you. Uh, I'm going to start with a question of my own and feel free to discuss among yourselves. But uh, I, I'm, I want to ask you whether this is a science story, a politics story, a public health story, and how have those various lenses distorted or enhanced coverage worldwide? Craig, why don't you begin? I think it's a, it's an omni story. It's not particularly in one category or another. That's the thing about this. It's just hit in every aspect of it. And the more you think about it, the more you realize that there are huge questions on every side. One of the things that we've tried to boil it down to is a kind of health versus wealth argument. And I think that the balance has been very, very heavily and understandably on the health side of the argument. We've rightly listened to epidemiologists, we've rightly listened to doctors, and as a result, we've had the lockdown. But two things can be true. One, that the health you know, is under huge threat, the health service is under huge threat. But secondly, that at the same time, because of the lockdown, the economy is under huge threat. I don't think we've begun to really understand the impact on the economy. We do understand the health impact, but not the economic one. So it's a huge story. We're only just beginning to understand it. David? Well, I think that it's both been a political story and a technical story and a public health story. The, the political is that political leaders have wanted to show that they're doing something. And they've chosen measures which aren't necessarily required, but that they feel are important. If you look at scenes from China, you'll see spraying down the streets with a disinfectant. That has absolutely no way, no role of playing in an outbreak such as this. What's necessary is to find the people, isolate those people, and stop transmission. So political leaders in many countries have used this as a means of showing they're doing something. And in Europe, political leaders have actually shut down economies without having a real exit plan as to what they plan to do. And many times this was against the advice of some of the technical leaders in those countries. John. Oh, it's, um, uh, Craig's right, it's an omni story. It's the biggest, it's the biggest story um, of my life. I'm 61. I feel very frustrated though, because in terms of, of um, uh, putting power under scrutiny, the vast numbers of journalists, including myself, most of the people who will be um, tuning into this, are on, the, are, are on the edges of it. I mean, we're living through it, and we're trying to, um, you know, I've gambled my life today by going to Waitrose. Uh, there's, a, there's an old friend of mine um, who used, his dad was in the commands, and he said, you know, going to Sainsbury's isn't the same as um, flying over Berlin. But, but at the same, so this thing impacts on all of us at home, and at the same time, you know, it's a massive political and economic story. I think for the moment, um, until we work out how to deal with this horrible thing, the vast majority of people around the world get it, and that actually it's, it's not health versus wealth, but at the moment it's lives 
um, versus wealth. And the vast majority of people, and you see the numbers, are content for the moment with the lockdown and where it, where it goes. Now, I'm suspecting that that will change and the story will change in the summer and in the winter as, as an old war reporter, I, I, and I've seen this in places like Yugoslavia and Iraq, as societies become more used to death, they become more callous and more brutal. And I think it, it's possible in, the few, uh, in six months' time, our attitude to the numbers of dead so far will be, it's okay because we need to open the economy. But I don't think that's there now. I'd like to address a couple of issues. Um, and, and I'll come to the whole basic problem for journalists of the complexity of this situation. The economics are complex, the epidemiology is complex, the science is complex, and it's, it's, we haven't done a brilliant job, I think, in simplifying, particularly as it's a moving target. Let's come back to that, but let me go to a political question. In both the US and in Britain, uh, we've had circumstances, uh, political circumstances, that's made journalists pull their punches. Here in the UK, uh, Boris Johnson was very ill, and I think the government, and we had no opposition, that gave the, the government a bit of a, a pass, at least for some weeks. And in the United States, President Trump's chaotic um, and not always rational press conferences have made a rigorous political follow-up very difficult. How have each of you um, seen the coverage damaged by those circumstances? Craig? Um, I don't accept the premise of your question. Um, I think the idea that we're seeing this in terms of journalists pulling punches um, doesn't really help us understand what's going on. Here. And I think that it's actually, as a former journalist myself, I, it's what I was trying to say in my early marks. I think the factory setting of, journal of journalists often is towards negativity or to throwing punches. And actually, I think what you're finding at the moment is a lot of people don't necessarily want to see this as a pugilistic event. They want journalists to be there as explainers and they want them to ask the right questions and they want them to ask probing questions. But the reality is the language and the terms in which journalists see the debate and see the action. And there's good reasons for that because of the way politicians have behaved in the past and the way things have been set in the past. But I just think seeing it in those terms and using terms like pulling punches, it's not really how people want this. This is a massive global problem. They want to understand it. They want to understand when mistakes have been made. And actually, I think they're much more prepared to allow benefit of the doubt unless there has been something which has been particularly egregious and outrageous stupidity. David, do you agree with that? Yeah, you know, I've found journalists always very helpful in outbreaks if you're willing to take the time to speak with the journalist and help them understand the issues and understand how they can present it in the right way. That's changing a little bit with social media. But in the past, it's been very true that the more time a technical group spent with a journalist, the better the messaging was that came from those journalists. So I think what's happened in the U.S., and I come from the Center for Disease Control based in Atlanta, is that the journalists are trying to get to these people and they're not permitted to speak. The people who are speaking are the political leaders and not the people who the journalists want to speak with. And as a result, we end up with wrong messages and messages that come from a politician and not from a technical person. How have you, what has been your reaction watching the, the information landscape in the United States since the beginning of this pandemic? Well, I always look to see where the CDC, the Center for Disease Control, is positioned and how they've taken over. But in fact, Tony Fauci from the National Institutes of Health, fortunately, has been able to take over, has been able to keep himself in the limelight and been able to give the correct messages, whereas the Center for Disease Control just doesn't give those messages that usually it was responsible for. They have great spokespeople. They've done it in the past. They're not doing it at present. They're not being allowed to do it at present. That's correct. John, do you, do you agree that journalists have pulled their punches and to what effect? I, th I think they have. And I think, I mean, listen, when Boris went to hospital, you'd have to have a heart of stone not to feel sorry for the man. And clearly, um, I thought his speech um, um, after he left hospital was very, very moving. And I was touched. And I'm not a supporter, obviously. Um, 
but I was very touched by the way he thanked his nurses and I thought, good on you, um, he got that and the doctors too. Having said that, I think the factory setting, is, to use Craig's analogy, of, um, of power is we're doing fine, thanks. We're all doing fine. And the problem is that um, you can think that so long as you don't lift your eyes and see what's been happening, for example, in Germany or New Zealand or South Korea. And in... The, and, um, um, in all of those countries are run by a woman. Um, and Angela Merkel is a scientist. And it seems to me that she listened to the science from the get-go and, and made a series of calls, which means that Germany has had markedly fewer deaths and also will be in a much better place economically um, to deal with this disaster um, um, when we... When, uh, um, when, we all get out of lockdown. So, so I think that, that I do feel sympathy for the politicians. I, think, I feel most of the time Matt, Matt Hancock, the um, health minister, is doing his best. And you can kind of feel that and sense that. Nevertheless, if you take the international comparisons, it's clear and obvious that Britain has made big mistakes. Look at our numbers of deaths. So the idea that journalism should kind of switch off on that isn't right. And I think, for example, I don't think there has been properly critical um, analysis or reporting on, for example, the Today programme, which is a massively important thing. And the other thing is that the other bits of the BBC haven't been working properly to, um, um, or hard enough, or been given enough access to ministers so that they can do their normal job. So, for example... Newsnight um, isn't having a great time at the moment because major players in the cabinet just aren't going there. So, so it, I, I feel that the system is pulling its punches and that comes from the bosses. I don't have great confidence in Tony Hall as a director general. It's one of the reasons I ended up leaving the BBC. And, and I think it's because he's very much, he sees himself as a school prefect rather than somebody who's going to ask tough questions. And, 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 and I don't think those tough questions were asked. I'd like to go back uh, for a minute to um, about the end of the second week of March when we heard, uh, I think it was Sir Patrick Valance say on the BBC that we had to reach herd immunity. And then a few days later we had research that suggested that that would be catastrophic. At that time, there were plenty of scientific voices uh, calling for a much earlier and more radical lockdown, and the government just wasn't doing it. Um, did did we did we miss uh, an opportunity there to be constructive and uh, perhaps get the government to act sooner? How do you see it, David? Well, you know. <laughs> Governments base their response on a risk assessment and on the information that they have. And I can't tell you what information the government had that made them make a decision not to lock down. I can tell you that the information that did convince governments to lock down was what was happening in Italy. And that's what the modelers took into account as they began to remodel the outbreak based on what they understood. Italy had a crisis in that they just could not accommodate the patients in their hospitals. And this was a message to the rest of Europe to pay attention and to decide what to do. And it was a message to the modelers to put more data and different data into their models, which they did. So I think you're, you're saying that, uh, that the... the position of the government in the second week of March is perfectly defensible. They couldn't have done anything more constructive because they didn't have the facts in from Italy. Is that what you're saying? Well, what I'm saying is that that's what changed. I don't know what facts the government had in at that time, but I do know that when the modelers took it seriously and put it into their models and turned out new data, that's what seemed to influence the government. Craig? 
Yeah, I mean, look, I'm not here to be an apologist for the government. And I'm sure at the end of this, there will be some very serious mistakes that are made clear. But what I do think is there's a real danger that we act as if there's a situation which is black and white. And actually, my experience of being in government, not fortunately having to deal with something, anything like as complicated and difficult as this, is you're quite often confronted by very, very difficult and complicated situations where you do not have the full information. You have to take decisions with limited information. You have to take decisions where people are arguing the toss. And we talk about the science and as if there was perfect information around that. In fact, there were a lot of questions around that and a lot of opposing theories and I think that it's often in government the, the reality of the situation and this may not be right is when you're in number 10 there's an awful lot of people out there with an awful lot of opinions who don't necessarily have full possession of the complexity of the facts that you have in front of you and the difficulty that you have with that there were people at that time who were arguing very seriously that if you shut the economy down and took a sledgehammer to it we would take a very very long time to recover from it and that also when you are in a re recession that is bordering on a depression people die then too they have very very serious impacts and effects so we were balancing a lot of information at the time and they may have jumped wrong or they may have jumped late but i think that actually that it's a bit more understandable than some people are presenting it as in a kind of black or white, up or down, left or right, binary situation. I'm going to go to questions in uh, just a couple of minutes, but let me ask you all to briefly rate the media, the media's success in simplifying the various aspects of this crisis for viewers or readers. Craig? Um, I think on the health side, they've done a very good job. And I think that that's primarily because the government has pushed the health side, particularly in terms of the lockdown. I don't think they've begun to explain the complexity of the economic difficulties that we're going to face. And I know for a fact that there are very, very senior cabinet ministers who are deeply worried about what's coming down the track and whether or not people properly understand the impact of continuing this lockdown. That's not to say we shouldn't continue the lockdown but there is going to be a real and serious impact of it. David. Um, you know, I think that um, overall, there have been a couple issues that the press has not been able to handle, not because they're just unable to handle it, but because it was so complex. And one of those is epidemiological modeling. Modeling is done for the public health community to be able to prepare for a best and a worst case scenario. And, and in those models, interventions can be submitted, which then show what could happen, what might happen, and what won't happen. But the press has always been um, convinced that the highest number is the number that they should use, and there hasn't been any correction of that. They've just gone out and said, this is what will happen, as if anybody knows what will happen. So the press is taking several things that are our hypotheses, if you would, and making them into reality, saying there will be a second wave, there will be many things, which nobody knows. We really don't know the destiny yet of this virus. And the second thing that is, is wrong, in my view, is that the press is putting too much belief in the fact that there will be a vaccine one day that will solve all the problems. And that could be or it could not be. There may be a vaccine, there may not be. There's a lot of research right now, but we don't understand the immunity to this virus. We don't understand whether that vaccine will be effective. And at the same time, production capacity is a huge problem. And if that vaccine is to be produced in quantities necessary for equitable distribution, other vaccines will have to be taken off the fill and finish line like measles and all the other vaccines that protect illness we know today. So it's a very complex issue. And the press is take, treating it many times as there will be a vaccine and this is what will happen. John. Generally, I think the health, um, I agree with Craig on this point, that they, um, the health journalism has been good broadly. Um, I'm, I'm listening to David's points there, but, but I feel, um, you know, as a consumer, I know everything um, or uh, the, the argument about the science, because it is an argument, but the argument about the science is pretty clear. I feel in terms of the politics, um, as I, you, you've already uh, heard me say this, I think that we have um, um, not enough light, not enough focus, not enough pressure was put on the British government when it was opposing lockdown for reasons, it seems, um, that 
that are wrong if you look at the um, experience of the more successful uh, countries. Um, one observation, I went to Italy uh, on a work job in late February, and I was, the moment I landed, I was tested by um, two uh, temperature guns immediately on landing. And four days later, I flew back uh, to Britain and there was nobody at the airports. So there's, there's all of this stuff that's going on. So I don't think that the, um, um, the British government was properly held to scrutiny on the politics of it. Now, the economics thing is harder because we still don't know. I mean, you can't run a, an open economy if the reproduction rate of this disease is shooting up and up and up and healthy people start dying in hospital. That's a serious possibility. That's why we're committed to lockdown. So I kind of get Craig's overarching point is, that, listen, this is so dark and so difficult and so foggy that it's hard to know. Even so, if the governments in Germ if the government of Germany can get this right, then there are big questions to be asked um, about about um, about Britain. Thank you very much. I'm I'm uh, going to do a technical leap here and go to one of our questioners and allow her to ask her question live. She's Heidi Hodgins, and if the system is working, Heidi, you'll be able to talk. Assuming you're still there. She's there. She may need to unmute. Yes. Heidi, try and unmute. Little red microphone to the lower left of your screen. All right. While you sort it out, I'll come back to you. I'm going to go to uh, Cormac. Um, oh, maybe. No, I can't. Okay. Cormac Smith, you, you've got a question. Let's hear from you. Um, Elizabeth, um, thank you very much. And if I could start by thanking you and the, and the rest of the panel for a fabulous event. Can you all hear me all right? Yes, we can. Good. Look, um, my question is, and, and just for the record, I've been a press officer for 30 years. I was recently a deputy director of communications at the cabinet office and the foreign office. I didn't cross, um, I didn't cross times with um, Craig, by the way, in case you're wondering, but... Um, if I have an area of expertise, it's around disinformation. I spent two years on behalf of our government as communications advisor to the foreign minister of Ukraine. So I learned a lot about disinformation and misinformation and that. My question is a simple one. The government this morning, the government this morning um, said that they would probably miss the target of 100,000. Um, at the time they said that, we were at 52,000 as today. And of course... The target date expires at midnight. So really, it's a three-part question. Why, why insert the word probably? Um, it, it's, it, it's, it's just, um, 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 does the truth not matter? And do the panel not think that using that sort of weasel words actually destroys public trust at a time when the government needs the trust and the cooperation of citizens the most? So my question is, why the word probably? Excellent. Clearly, it was going to miss it. Thanks very much. Uh, who'd like to pick that up? Well, I mean, look, the reality is that, that, that we still aren't at midnight, are we? So um, there, is, there is a degree of doubt. And so I don't, I don't have such a huge problem with probably. I think that the big question here is, why did Matt Hancock feel the need to do that? Um, he was in a situation, I think, where the government felt it needed to fill the vacuum and shape the story and felt under significant pressure from journalists in order to start getting some runs on the board and showing it was making action. I just don't buy this idea that somehow the, the, you know, the pusillanimous media has somehow not been putting these questions. All of the points that John is making has been, have been widely debated and widely discussed and widely put in terms of debates and questions and arguments that are, that are ongoing. I think that the reality is we live in a world where journalists, are, where politicians are expected to provide a running commentary. And in this situation, they're expected to run, provide a running commentary and action where they don't have the tools and the ability to necessarily do that. And actually, I think that the, the British public is showing a bit more maturity in terms of preparedness to accept that. I don't think there will be some huge outcry about the fact that they've missed the target. Um, but do I think it was a wise thing to do? No, I don't. I want to add to that and, and, and ask you whether you think the government is 
giving the British people the roadmap they want to get out of this thing. They have been asked time and again in these briefings, and they've just reverted to, to their simple slogan, stay home, uh, protect the NHS, save lives. Fair enough. But after two weeks, uh, uh, personally, I've had enough of that. I want to hear how they're going to uh, go forward. And testing is certainly part of that. And we've heard almost no detail on that. Yes. It, it, it seems to me it's a real messaging uh, failure. Well, again, I disagree with the premise of your question totally. I think what you are failing to understand is they don't have the answer. There is no magic exit plan that is just waiting to be articulated. They don't have the facts. They've set out five tests. When you look at those five tests, it is not clear what the answer to all of them are. And I think it's really incumbent on journalists to sometimes stop and think for a moment, maybe there isn't a perfect situation. Maybe they don't know the answers. Maybe this is an unprecedented situation and we can't provide you with the answers that you want or the stories that you want in a 24-7 media world. You just can't. And I think that there needs to be a degree of maturity in understanding that and just demanding an exit plan when we're in the situation we are now is frankly not a very um, grown up thing to do. There could be uh, an offering of some detail on the options. I think that broadly speaking, people have been hugely patient uh, and they are uh, towing the line. But at some stage, the government risks losing public support. But I take your point. I'd like this, to hear what David this, thinks. This oh, morning, let me give you one sentence this morning. This morning we heard that the tube in London is operating at 5% capacity and that if it goes to 10% capacity, it won't be able to cope because of social distancing. That is just one example of of how an exit plan is almost impossible at the moment. And that's just in one city in the United Kingdom. If you understand the complexity and the difficulty of the problems that are being faced, you then might start thinking, actually, the reality of having an exit plan is going to have to be a very incremental and slow, slow thing. And it isn't going to just create a headline immediately. David. Yeah, well, many countries have actually adopted a way of dealing with this outbreak that's more classical. In, in identifying cases and doing contact tracing. And those countries exist in Asia, in Singapore, Thailand, uh, Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, South Korea, Taiwan, in, in Germany as well. They've stuck to the initial principle of good outbreak containment. And they've been very transparent in telling the communities what they're doing and how they're doing it. And that's been very helpful to the communities. But then all of a sudden, this idea that you had to really flatten the curve of people admitting, admitted to hospital through all those plans askew, especially in Europe. In Asia, they stuck to those plans. They're still doing that type of a response. Whereas in Europe, the response is very complex. It's different in each country. We've heard that Sweden continues to let the virus enter in a controlled manner, thinking they were following what the UK was doing at the start. And they've continued, whereas the UK then went to a different strategy. So there's much going on in all of Europe. And my philosophy is we need to build the ship together instead of trying to destroy it by destructive journalism at this point in time. But what about the drip feed of information to the public? Or do you think that so far the authorities, public health and the British government have been generous enough with, the, with information about everything, but especially where we go from here? Or what the possibilities are of how we go from here. Well, certainly there's been a lot of understanding about the outbreak and what's going on in the United Kingdom and, and how that's being um, affecting populations. And the government's beginning to talk about the problems that are occurring in those people who don't have COVID and gradually bringing in other information. So I think it is trying to be transparent. As far as the strategies, I agree with Craig. There just was no exit plan when governments clamped down and I don't think those plans are yet in place. John, you want to add something? Go ahead. Um, it's simple. Uh, Craig's right. This is unprecedented, but it was not unexpected. And so Panorama the other day, I think very rightly, got a hold of a brilliant story about the shortlist, uh, about the stockpile. And there was a, I mean, there were serious problems with the stockpile. A lot of the stuff was out of date. They, would, for example, have double counted uh, gloves and so forth and so on. And actually, this is um, um, uh, that one piece of journalism I thought was very good. Now, it's been attacked um, by um, the right winger, 
website, uh, Guido Fawkes, because most of the doctors on it were um, sympathetic to the Labour Party, some of them were members or whatever. Now, if you're, it's always difficult slagging off your own bosses, and the most obvious explanation for what happened there was that simply that, um, that the only people who were willing to go on Panorama were, were people who were kind of strong trade union members, blah, 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 but, 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 there were there has been problems with planning there's been problems with with making sure that britain was properly protected for this i understand and sympathize and get the the point that um craig keeps on making which is that this is really really difficult and there are no easy solutions i get that but nevertheless i don't think that the british government has has behaved um and often you know um in a strong way but i'd love to hear from more more questions because yes more. all right well i'm going to go uh to those who are standing by again and ask ben booth ben are you there and what's your question hello can you hear me can yes hi well, thank you um so i've got sort of a two-part question um john mentioned about uh, north korea are they com are they communicating with the world health organization are they actually um are they actually being unsecretive for once um do we know anything about coronavirus in north korea that would be quite interesting because now in north korea they probably just go now nah, there's nothing wrong with us we're fine we're all the best we've won the world cup everything's great and the olympics um so you know, you know, and um, with King Jong King Jong Un, when is the likelihood of us finding out anything to do with his uh, situation? Um, but also, the, the second question is: in the last year, I've been very lucky to um, get to travel a lot. I've been to the Middle East and various different countries, and the thing that I've noticed is that um, England, in particular, Great Britain, we don't do things in the same way as, as many other countries. And in particular, with the lockdown, we were, okay, well, this is happening in uh, wherever it happened. It's very serious. It's going to come to us at some point. Uh, we, didn't, we just went, we're England, we'll get on with it. And a lot of our people just seem to ignore the lockdown, ignore um, the issues that we're facing, and we seem to have embarrassed ourselves. Um, wow. And somebody else I spoke to said, uh, oh, it's just going to come back. And so just uh, wondering um, what the panelist opinion of Great Britain uh, dealing with it actually is. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Okay, David, why don't you start? Well, I'm going to try to find the answer about North Korea. I don't know, but I have it in my files. And I'll be looking at that. If others want to speak, I'll come out with the answer on North Korea. But as far as I know, they have been sharing information through the WHO regional office in New Delhi. Whether that information is accurate depends on what people believe about the accuracy of reporting of any government. And so I'll get that information as you go on. I'll take a look and see what has come in from North Korea. John, did you have anything to add? North Korea has a, <laughs> it's a deeply dishonest state where there are no journalists. And so there has been, certainly there was massive problems with their honesty over uh, statistics uh, during the Great Famine in the, um, in the 90s, which killed maybe three or four million people. So um, I'd be skeptical of, of, of the information. But, you know, clearly, is the leader alive or dead? North Korea fails um, on, on, on any level. I think... Um, our, our lockdown is significantly different. I've got uh, great friends in Italy, and they, if they go out to the shops or the pharmacy, they have to get permission. They have to print out a piece of paper saying, I'm going from my house at this address to the supermarket at this address, and then I'm returning. And you get stopped, and friends of mine have been stopped. Um, so the, the, the lockdown here is way easier than it is in, um, in, in countries like Italy and Spain. Having said that, I think compliance here has been almost shockingly good. Um, and that actually people, I think, and I just looked at the polls uh, the other day, it does feel as though um, um, there's a little bit more activity, but not much. And there is still support for it. Obviously, the question you've already uh, raised, it, Elizabeth, is, What's your strategy? And there's a problem here. I mean, you can argue. So the argument I think with Craig is this: is 
it's incredibly hard, but at the same time, all of us are making massive sacrifices. I'd love to see my kids. I would love to have a drink with my friends, and 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 actually, and I love to do all sorts of things which I'm not doing, and that goes for every single one of us. So it does feel fair enough to say, you know, to hear from the government what the strategy is, and I. And I've got a rough idea of the answer is, listen, it's very, very difficult. There are no easy solutions, and we're going to have to do this very, very slowly. Angela Merkel has already spelt it out. It's that if we get the numbers wrong, then it gets, um, then we're in trouble. I mean, if, if, if the virus reprodu starts reproducing um, fast again, you've got to lock down again. And that's almost worse than where we are now. Um, but I think some strategy would be good. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Cormac uh, came back to us to say uh, that he 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 had asked why the um, let me gather my thoughts here why the the uh, government ha had had promised a hundred thousand doses of vaccine and then kept pretending to inch up to that. And Craig, you said I don't know if you were being facetious. Well, it's not midnight yet; they may get there. But it does beg a larger question, that is, in a, in a, a pandemic like this, is it better if uh, an official doesn't know or can't give uh, a clear answer to say, look, I don't know? Or is the um, projection of clear and strong leadership, does that trump everything? And I think this is where we've come to the heart of it. This is the absolute essence of what is going on at the moment. And I think if we're honest, journalists and politicians have too often in the past created a dynamic where people feel unable to be frank and say, I do not know. I do not have enough information. I've never faced anything like this before. On the one hand, if I continue with the lockdown, the economy is going to crash. On the other, if I continue with the lockdown, if I don't continue with the lockdown, the health service is going to crash. This is an unprecedented situation. We have a situation in this country where I think too often journalism has expected things to be binary. It has expected politicians to have answers and it has been deeply critical of them if they are honest enough to say, I don't know, or I've made a mistake, or I've got something wrong here. And I think what we're seeing with coronavirus, hopefully, might be a moment where, through the general public, through um, just the sheer seriousness of the situation, we address that, and they're honest about that, and there are politicians who've got that wrong, and there are journalists who've got that wrong. Just before um, I let you go, Ben, uh, uh, Craig, on this, issue. Ben Booth tagged a second question to his first question. That was our previous questioner. And he said, really, ha did, was Br Britain guilty of a certain confidence in British exceptionalism when it became clear that this pandemic was really ripping through Asia and Italy was starting to be hit? Uh, we, we were very slow to react. Is that some kind of historical British exceptionalism or even arrogance? Possibly, but I think what you more likely is that the alarm has been raised several times in the past. And I think a lot of people felt with SARS and bird flu and stuff like that. One of the reasons why the Asian um, countries have done so well is because SARS was a serious problem for them. And it wasn't so much in, in our part of the world. Now, is that a mistake? Clearly, we should, have, we should have been ready and set for this in an ideal world, but everything's for the best in the best of all possible worlds. Um, I do think if you go back to the beginning of this crisis, the one thing that everybody was paranoid about is, is our health service going to fall over? And are we going to be in a situation where people are dying in corridors and on floors? That has not happened. And we actually have capacity to spare in the health service. That is a good thing that has been got right. I'm sure that there are many other things that will turn out to have been got wrong. Um, I'd like to go to some of the questions that have been uh, submitted in text. Uh, and I think I'll begin with Amy Price, who asks, why in the UK does speaking truth to power seem so difficult in this pandemic? Macron, in a press conference, apologized to the French people for the failures of his government. We really haven't seen that here. Uh, and and uh, Amy says it, 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 to her, in her estimation, it looks as if uh, quest hard questions or those sorts of admissions would be judged unpatriotic. What's really going on? Uh, Craig, are you um, unpatriotic? 
Um, I just yeah. don't. I, look, I mean, again, I, look, I keep giving the same answer. I don't accept the <laughs> idea that truth has not been spoken to power. I do not think we have shy and retiring journalists in this country who are not prepared to offer, ask difficult questions. They certainly are. And in fact, one of the issues that has been debated in this and in a lot of the surveys that have been done of people is people aren't quite happy about the degree to which they feel that questions have been seen through a political lens rather than an informational lens. Um, you know, at the beginning in his, his opening remarks, John made the point about Panorama and Piers Morgan and this kind of thing. I mean, people are asking difficult questions. I don't accept. None of the things that John has said to me are a revelation to me. I'm not sitting here thinking, oh, my God, I've never heard that discussed before. I've heard it discussed endlessly. But, 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 but it, it's, I, well, um, I, I've said what I said. Macron did, I mean, he did a great interview um, with the Financial Times and he was, it was, I thought it was uh, very, very thoughtful and he did express how incredibly difficult this was. And I felt, um, a, I'm not saying an outpouring of love for the man because that would sound unpatriotic, but it, it was impressive. And he apologised for the screw-ups that the French government has done. I haven't heard that at all from the British government and I think, uh, what Cormac was saying uh, was is kind of on the money in that um, the problem, you know, we're going to get 100,000 tests. Now, I understand why the government did that. I don't think it's a, you know, it's a good thing we've got a test. But also, they should trace as well. This is what's been happening in Germany, South Korea, and the more successful uh, countries. But so the lack of apology um, for what's gone wrong is something which. Um, you can live with for a while, but, uh, you know, I kind of want my government to be grown up and to be honest with me. And that also speaks to the strategy point. And uh, I and I don't think there has been enough pressure, but, but it's clear that Craig and I disagree about that. Let me add, uh, David, did you want to add something? I was going to uh, layer on one more thought to the same kind of discussion. This is, comes from Monica Woodley. And she asks, really, are we avoiding talking in simple and clear terms about the inevitable equation here? Lives uh, versus the economics of handling this crisis. And inevitably, uh, if we, uh, different exits from COVID will mean different uh, uh, fatality numbers, but maybe uh, allow people to return to some economic uh, viability sooner. Do we need to really be talking about that more frankly? David, well, where are you on that? Or who would yeah. like to start? Yeah. You know, I'll start because in the medical profession, that's a discussion you can't have because saving lives is the dedication of the medical community and an oath is taken when you complete your studies to save lives if you can. So it's a very difficult decision and a decision that the medical community very often will not undertake. And it's a dilemma for governments when they're trying to weigh what's happening in the, in, with the inequalities, what's happening with deaths among the people who can't access health care, and what's happening to an older group of people who are close to death anyway, as some people would say. So it becomes a very difficult decision for governments, and I don't think that the health community is able to provide much rational input into that because of this belief that lives must be saved at all costs. So it's but, a, that, argument. but that modeling has to be going on, and those equations are out there, and ultimately politicians are going to have to choose. Should that be part of the debate? It's, it's wrenching, but it's crucial. So I think one of the things I think would be really interesting is that when we see the numbers of deaths, that actually one thing I think journalists could really help with is digging down into who exactly is dying. What are the groups of, in society who are dying and dying disproportionately? obviously the elderly. Obesity, I understand, is a massive factor in all of this. Now, the question is, I think some economists and the columnist Matthew Paris, I think, have actually been quite brave in trying to push forward the argument of, look, maybe we need to try and understand that already in society, we do allow a certain number of deaths in certain areas. The National Institute of Clinical Excellence makes decisions about what drugs people will get based on how expensive it is to keep them alive for a number of years. And 
I think that, the, forgive me if I've got my facts around wrong, but I think £30,000 for a drug for an extra year of life is, you know, that is a barrier and that we do that. We allow people to get into metal boxes and drive around at 70 miles an hour and understand that thousands of people will die as a result of that. These are all very, very difficult things. And certainly if your grandmother or mother is impacted by this, you certainly don't want to hear that. But when you start balancing that against the fact that in a recession or in a depression, there are serious issues in terms of impacts on people's lives. There are serious impacts of keeping a lockdown going in terms of the amount of um, domestic abuse that's going through the roof, the mental health problems that are coming out through that. The, the nuance and the richness of that argument, I do not think has come to the fore enough. And I think that actually some brave outliers are trying to make the case and make the argument, but I'm not sure it's something that society is quite ready for yet. Mm -hmm. There's also um, another argument that has to be made, and that's the argument of more investment in public health, in health promotion, in preventing the comorbidities that we now see are the risk factors for death in this outbreak. Because promoting a healthy lifestyle and accomplishing that is really important. And that may be why countries such as Germany and other countries which invest more in public health, in their public health institutes, are ahead of what appears to be going on in the UK right now. Public health has to be a part of the discussion. I'm going to push the frontiers of technology back a little further even and uh, go to uh, somebody who's been listening on the telephone. Now, I can't see your name. I just see your phone number. Uh, it ends in 4095. And if you'd like to <laughs> pose your question, <laughs> go ahead. Have we got... Uh, Seven seven five nine double one four zero nine five. All right. Well, I'm going to move on to another for the other person who's hanging on on the phone, um, and your your number ends in eight three two six. Are you there? Oh, so that was a failure. All right, then. Well, I'm going to go back to the conventional. Uh, oh, look, it's on green. Oh, wait, wait. Hello. Hello. Yes. Hi. Go ahead. Mm, we almost had lift off. <laughs> Are you there? <laughs> okay. Anthony Knox is uh, joining us online. And Anthony, if you've still got your question on the tip of your tongue, yeah, let's hear it. I'm, um, I, um, I'm, the thing that worries me most of all about this is that... Um, I remember 50 years ago, living in London, nearly 50 years ago, when I turned to the Irish Times and the Financial Times as my only sources of accurate news, and I, I, I went back to Ireland and joined the BBC and later ITV in the, in the middle of the Troubles. Um, and I find myself in a similar position now where I don't believe that things are being accurately reported in Britain. The, the one thing that I find most disturbing is that the excess deaths in the Z score of excess deaths in, in England in particular are shockingly worse than virtually any other country around the world. Maybe you could help us out. What are Z, the Z score? Z score is, is really just the excess number of deaths over the, over the average. So ah, right, gotcha. You're, you're, forgetting, you're forgetting about what is reported in terms of, um, you know, for one... COVID-specific deaths. Just, exactly, yes. Yeah, you're just okay. looking at the excess deaths. Um, right. There's a group called Euronomo who published these, a European group who published these around the world. And it's worth going on the Euronomo website to see the excess deaths. And England's excess deaths are on a different scale from every other country. Italy and France were bad, Spain were bad, but they've got a sharp downward turn. England's has shot up and is staying up at the moment, um, is not decreasing. Well, I'd, I'd like, like to hear from the reporting, yeah. the reporting of that that worries me. This is not something that's known. It's not being reported. I've learned about this, I think, from Irish reporters, probably from, from RTE or from well, American I, reporters. I, yeah. I don't hear about it in, 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 in UK reporting. Oh, okay. Well, that's a, a very interesting question. I, I have heard the statistic uh, reported, but you're right, not very often. And I, John has something to say, and I'd like to hear David on this too. Go ahead. Mm. Well, the Financial Times, has, has, um, the economics editor of the Financial Times has said there's a massive problem here. And if you look at um, um, deaths for all causes, uh, and some of those 
cause was not reported. So the the underlying assumption is these are COVID deaths, which have not been uh, detected because of a lack of testing. Primarily, well, um, you need to add something like twenty thousand. So the, the moment the the total um, British death number is something like twenty six thousand. But if you, if according to the all all numbers of of, of deaths, and it's slight, there's a time lag with this because. You, you, um, because of reporting problems, but essentially our total death toll, says the FT, is, is something like 47,000. Now, this has been why, you know, this has been reported by the FT and it's been picked up everywhere. So I wouldn't criticize the media for this, but I would, it's another source of anxiety and it's another um, something to ask serious questions of the government. Is that, are, we, are we talking about the right numbers? Um, it's a problem. I, the, the other thought, which I don't think we're reflecting on um, enough, is the experience in the United States. Because what's happening in the United States is that, it, that Trump is continually undermining the public health message that social distancing and lockdown is the best thing, it seems to be, while never saying it loud and strong. He keeps on mocking social distancing and attacking governors for enforcing it properly, uh, but, but never um, going there. And if you look at the numbers in the United States, they are truly terrible. So the, the problem um, for those people who say, look at the, look at the economic uh, wreckage that we're causing, look at what's happening in the United States, and I think, like, dead people can't buy things. So you've got to, you, you know, that is also part of the balance. I do feel, as an old war reporter, I've seen countries like Yugoslavia, that, that, that civility, civilization became, after the war got going, it became, people became more callous and more brutal, and things which were genuinely shocking, shocking for me, and Yugoslavs became more and more normal. And so the conversation about, we really, really need to open up our economies. There's a moment when people, I think, later this year, um, will will be m much more ready to listen to this. And I appreciate the difficulty of politicians is that that they can't go there now because we're still in shock about what's happening and we're, everybody's afraid. At the same time, what are the scientific solutions to this? But the United States. Look at it. It's not how to do this, is it? David, let's go back to the, uh, the Z deaths. Uh, as I understand it, it's a, it's a number of total deaths in the country. And if we look at, say, uh, April or March in, in England, compared to past years, the number is way up higher than what the government is telling us. They've got uh, numbers for COVID deaths. And it's that discrepancy that uh, the questioner was asking about. What, what are you thinking about this? Is it underreported? Are we completely missing a huge and very worrying story? Well, I, think the I know the government is aware of this. And the Office of National St Statistics has, in fact, provided um, the results of overall death and COVID deaths. The problem is that the, Office Nas the National Office of Statistics only gets those figures at the end of the month. They're tabulated based, based on the vital registration of forms. So they come in and they're tabulated, and there's a lag in that as opposed to the deaths from COVID, which are reported every day by the government. And so now we're beginning to see that there is a major, major increase in deaths, aside from those that are COVID deaths, due to lack of ability to access the health system or the growing inequalities that are occurring. And this is happening in every country. I haven't seen the comparison, but it's really early to make that comparison now. I think all countries are going to find that they've had a tremendous amount of mortality outside hospitals that occurred because people couldn't access usual health care. So the discrepancy is not COVID deaths that are being incorrectly identified, but rather people who are dying from other so almost secondary reasons of this pandemic. That's right. If that's not registered in hospitals, it doesn't get reported until the vital statistics come out, the death forms, the death certificates come in to the Office of Statistics. And that's where things differ. There's a, a difference in the periods when each of those are tabulated. 
So we're, we, we're, that's a big story waiting to be reported uh, in the coming days because the April numbers will be out very soon. Yes, and I think it was reported at the beginning of this month as well yes. about the March figures. So yes, it will come out. And I know the government is very concerned about this, and that goes into this formula of what are we doing and how do we do it more effectively. And Elizabeth, I just have one more reply, and that's on North Korea. Yes. They are not reporting to WHO on a regular basis. No. They are not? They are, they are not. 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 Well, I didn't hear it. Is it they are or they're not? They are not. Good. Well, when I say no, good, good. <laughs> bad, but it, yeah, <laughs> having been there, that's, uh, <laughs> that's exactly what I expected. Um, yes, uh, there are no corners in North Korea. Right. All right. We've got, um, we're at uh, just past the four o'clock mark, um, and this has been hugely enjoyable. I think what I'll do is take one more question from Ivor Wells, who's been waiting for some time. And after that, uh, we'll have a one, uh, a quick wrap up, uh, a comment from each of you and a response in response to a question from me. So Ivor Wells, over to you. Maybe he's given up. He's got to, he's got to unmute. Oh yeah. Ivor, uh, unmute you, sir. Yeah. Unmute yes. again. He unmuted briefly. He needs to unmute again. Ivor, unmute again. Can you hear me now? Yes. yes. Fantastic. Um, thank you so much. I've, I've really enjoyed this, um, this, this discussion. It's, it's really good to hear some, some really experienced journalists talking through um, some of these, you know, tricky, tricky issues that we're all, that we're, we're all struggling with. Um, particularly as consumers of news. My, my, my question is, is, is perhaps a slightly broader one in the sense that I've, my, my background is I'm an uh, international development um, consultant and I've spent a lot of time um, working internationally um, and I guess you could say representing UK PLC around the world in emerging markets. I'm, I'm particularly interested in the effect that this could be having on Britain in a sort of cultural sense, in the sense that I think Britain, in many ways, and for many good reasons, prides itself as being a, a net exporter of, of knowledge and expertise and innovation and scientific, um, scientific knowledge and expertise. Um, and we've certainly heard a lot of that throughout the Brexit process in particular, in terms of Britain's new direction of travel um, and where that's, where that's taking us as a country. I'm wondering what the panelists think about how, how, do, how do you think that a lot of the failures that we've seen in Britain, without wanting to sort of unnecessarily put the boot in, but you know, I think everybody can accept there has been failures. How do you think that will affect our willingness and our commitment to learn from other countries, and particularly countries that we perhaps consider to be competitors with? And I would also perhaps add to the list countries um, with whom we tend to expect to import or um, in, um, export knowledge to, uh, perhaps more than we've imported knowledge from in the past. Thank you very much. Craig, why don't you kick off? Yeah, I, I tend to have a fairly benign view of this. I think that this is such a serious issue that learning the lessons from other countries, I don't think anybody will will have, have a huge problem with. And I think that it's pretty clear that the way in which some of the Asian countries like South Korea have dealt with it is excep exceptional and in the post wash up. I think there will be a lot of uh, analysis of that. I think there will also be a lot of analysis of how the health service is set up. We had four and a half thousand ICU beds that looked painfully low at various stages early on. And I think there will be a reassessment and I think there'll be a grown up reassessment of that. And, um, it will be expected. David? You know, I can't answer that question in particular, but what I can say is that the world is really turned upside down because of the responses that have been occurring in Europe and in North America, as opposed to those in Asia. And I have a student in an executive course at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine who I mentor. She's out in Mongolia where she lives. And on a recent mentoring um, with her, she said to me, she said, you know, she said, we used to look to Europe and North America to understand how to deal with these things, and we don't know where to look now. And I think that should be a message for us all, that we've got to get our act together, and we've got to really move ahead and show the leadership that's necessary in a world that's asking for it. John. I feel um, that Britain PLC is going to take a hit. 
um, I feel there is a fair and reasonable explanation as far as the Asian countries are concerned because they were hit by SARS and MERS and they learn from that. So, for example, the South Koreans had massive... Um, they, they knew how to test and trace and they went for it straight away. And also that they had a massive stockpile and uh, they went for it. Um, so, yes, there is a fair and reasonable explanation for the success of a lot of... Um, um, Asian countries. However, um, as a plastic paddy, I was shocked when the Republic of Ireland um, cancelled St. Paddy's Day. Um, and, and this, as well as my Italian experience, which kind of um, warned me that other countries were taking this far more seriously than Britain uh, was, that was another moment. And it's now there are, you know, obviously. Um, London in particular is an um, international hub, but at the same time, we've kept Heathrow open. There's been no testing of anyone coming through Heathrow. That was always felt to me crazy the moment I got tested at, uh, at Venice Airport uh, in late February. So I think Britain and the United States um, are looking as though we're, the two countries are going to come out of this badly, but not getting it. And again, I'm afraid to say this, but the, the, the European exception is Germany, where the deaths are way, way lower than they are here per capita. And that is because they did um, testing and tracing and, and lots and lots of kits from the get-go. So that the international comparisons that the Anglo-Saxon countries um, are going to be, um, we're going to take a hit, I think. No question. Thank you very much. All right, uh, one more last round, and I'm, I'm just going to ask each of you how you think the post-COVID world, or in what respect will the post-COVID world most be different? Craig. Um, I think that there will be an expectation that there is a magic money tree and that that can be shaken again. Mm -hmm. I also think that we see COVID has acted as a massive accelerant. And so trends that we've been seeing in terms of businesses um, have just been massively accelerated. And businesses that Warren Buffett famously said, when the tide goes out, you discover who's been swimming naked. Um, I think lots of businesses are discovering that and it's caused a lot of exposure there. And so I think that reality is that fast forward has been pressed. And so it also, not just in the world of business, but in terms of geopolitics as well, it feels as if trends that were already clear have been fast forwarded. So the movement of the world towards Asia and the, the preeminence of Asia in this century, I think it's been fast forwarded as well. So I think huge, huge changes have happened and it's acted as a massive catalyst for things that were probably already happening, but would have happened at a slower pace. David? Well, I think that um, this outbreak or this pandemic has given us glimpses of what could be in the future. We've seen a lack of pollution in blue skies, for example, and we've seen many, many good benefits from virtual panels such as this, avoiding wear and tear on the human organism, but also saving the need to travel to go to participate in a panel such as this. These are opportunities which we've been able to take advantage of, including new apps that are helping us to get along better in communities. And I think we should see this as an opportunity to really change the way we've been living and try to do some new things that we've learned how to do during this pandemic in the future so that we do have a better world, a more green world, where we all are more comfortable and have a better life for us and for our children. John Sweeney, last word to you. I miss pubs so much. <laughs> I, I miss pubs so much I'm worried because uh, financially, if this is going to take 18 months, fingers crossed, fingers crossed, then there's a whole bunch of old businesses um, may hit the wall, like pubs, like newspapers. Um, Craig's right that technology is on fast forward. David's right that green is lovely walking around London listening to birdsong in the morning rather than the racket of planes coming into Heathrow. Um, let's try and treasure and keep some of the good bits of this awful time. Um, I also feel politically that um, I think the whole country, and I think has shifted 10 degrees to the left, 
There is such a thing as society, said Boris Johnson. It's necessary and proper and right to celebrate our NHS workers. I said thank you to my bin man the other day. And like it's a conversation I wouldn't have had in the time before, but I just said thank you very much, mate, because I appreciate his public service. And I think that's sunk into all of us. I think there should be a reckoning with the people who rule the Chinese Communist Party. They sat on this awful thing. They didn't tell the truth to the world for, for something like six weeks um, or at least four weeks. And those four weeks could have bought a time and they could have stopped it. So the idea that governments, um, yes, um, economically the world may tilt to Asia, but also at the same time, honesty and transparency in politics in, and and acceptance that journalism is a, is, a, is a social good, China too um, has to change. Gentlemen, thank you so very much. All those comments on a greener world and honesty and transparency and fewer flights from your mouths to God's ear, as they say. And I want to thank you for a really wonderful discussion. Thanks to everybody as well who dialed in or joined us online. And once again, I will uh, encourage you to have a look at the Frontline website and sign up for some of the sessions that are coming up in the coming weeks. Stay well, everybody, and uh, I look forward to seeing you again. Goodbye.